Hey everybody, thank you so much for tuning in to our latest community conversation here at Atlantic Health System. Uh, this is how we are going to be doing our, all of our Facebook Lives, giving you an opportunity to learn some really important information about how we as a system are dealing with uh, coronavirus or COVID-19. Uh, my name is Luke Margolis, I'm the Corporate Communications Director for Atlantic Health System, and I'm excited today to be joined by Dr. Jan Schwartzmiller, the Chief Medical and Academic Officer for Atlantic Health System. Dr. Jan, thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks so much, Luke, and I appreciate all of you joining us this afternoon. Um, I first want to thank community members for the things that you're doing every day, including continuing to social distance, to wash your hands regularly, and to wear your masks, which we're doing today to demonstrate, well, actually, we are doing it every day, and we want to demonstrate how important it is. I also want to thank the Atlantic Health System team members. Um, we, we recognize the extraordinary work that's been going on from the clinical staff, including the nurses, the physicians, the respiratory therapists, but also all of our team members who are vital to the care that we provide every day, including our laboratorians, the pharmacy, um, our IT department, our human resources department, so integral. And, and I could go on and on, but then I would forget just one as opposed to many. <laughs> so um, just please, um, all of you, um, thank you for, for all that you, you have done and you continue to do. I think it's, it's a great point that folks, um, they see the maybe the frontline caregivers uh, and, and rightfully so, folks have been talking about them a lot, but there is such an infrastructure of people around that that sometimes maybe our audience may not be familiar with or may not know about those folks in the lab and all of those. Absolutely. Key, key to the care we provide. Um, so, Dr. Jen, and, and for the folks who are uh, watching, I'll give you just a little bit of the rundown of how we're going to do this. Um, and this is um, our third one of these, and if you want to see any of the ones we've done previously, you can find those, of course, on our website, um, and you'll see a little square on our homepage where you can find all those or just on our Facebook page. Um, so what we'll do is we'll talk about a couple of prepared questions that I have, um, but really this is an opportunity uh, for us to share some of the questions you've submitted uh, that, um, that Dr. Jan can talk to a little bit about, and, and we'll sort of try to get to as many of those as we can. We really picked a couple that are reflective of the larger subject matter. Mm -hmm. Many of the questions submitted are sort of similar, so it gives okay. an opportunity to do that. So why don't we start first with, um, let's take a step back. Mm -hmm. uh, folks at home may not know this, but you and I have been talking about this for several months now we have. Um, as we as a system have gotten ready for this. Yep. Um, so let's go back to that. Early on, um, there's a lot of work that, that you put in and that you have been working on to make sure that some of our policies, our protocols, that we were set up to be able to handle this. Yep. Can you give our, our folks at home a sense of, of the thought process we put to work to come up with those sure. and what was important as we did that? Sure. So, so as we ended last year on December 31st, you may recall that there began to be reports out about cases of clusters of pneumonia in a specific area of China. I listened the way everybody listened, thinking, hmm, remember SARS, you know, is there something we need to worry about? And as the month went on, we understood that the characteristics of a pandemic might actually be this particular um, virus. So when we think about a pandemic, what makes us worried? We're worried if there's a new infection, a novel infection, a strain of infection, we've never seen it before, that could result in, P in a whole, in, in a huge population becoming infected because they don't have any immunity to it. Then we worry about something that's easy to spread from person to person. That's the only way a pandemic's going to occur. And then finally, something that makes people relatively ill. Um, and so as we watched within Atlantic Health System and, and throughout the country, we realized that this was a pathogen that had those characteristics. So we, we, when this was not the first time, it's the first time we've had a pandemic of this nature since 1918 when we had the influenza um, pandemic world, throughout the world. Um, but we, we've had a lot of experience with preparing for um, these kind of situations starting in 2001. You all probably recall the anthrax attacks, the possibility that we needed smallpox vaccines, going on to 2009 H1N1, the Ebola issues, the SARS issues, et cetera, et cetera. So it's been the responsibility of healthcare organizations throughout the United States to be preparing, to be ready in case that we had another event like one of those or, God forbid, like the 1918 influenza pandemic. So we, we took out actually our pandemic flu plan because we knew from what we were learning that this organism was similar to influenza, although we've seen it has lots of differences too. And we started creating our teams. And our teams were people who came together with expertise working across the system, critical care physicians, laboratory, et cetera, 
to prepare. So we would take our prior plans and we would modify them based on what we learned day in, day out from mm -hmm. the CDC, the World Health Organization, the li literature that was being published so we could be prepared to move forward. We have um, two, from a, from a safety standpoint, mm -hmm. there's obviously our team members and our patients, right? right. And, and that's really keeping them safe is, is our top priority throughout this process. So what, and, and to, I think that folks at home are obviously especially focused on what we've been doing to keep patients safe, but right. for both, for both sure. groups of people. What, what sort of um, things were we keeping in mind as we were lining out, okay, well, here's what we definitely need to do to make sure we're keeping yeah. those groups of people safe. And Luke, that's so consistent with how we think about things. As we think about our, our goals as an organization, we're always thinking about what we can do to offer and provide the best quality care to our patients. And then we're also thinking what we can do for our team members to make sure that we have a safe working environment. So this is consistent with how we think about things with Atlantic. So um, the first things that we needed to think about was how we keep everything safe for our patients and our staff. So in order to do that, we had to make sure we had the right supplies. So those supplies are important to the safety of our patients and they're important to the safety of the staff. So you've all heard a lot on, um, on the, in the news about personal protective equipment. So we had to, you know, take a look at what our current supplies were, start ordering additional equipment and or additional medications with the anticipation that the problem that at that point we were only seeing in China might spread um, wider and we'd have a problem in the United States. The other thing we started doing as we started seeing this um, virus in our communities is we screened people before they came into the organization. So before and you, you come in the door, you have to have your temperature taken and there's some questions about symptoms and you could be a staff member or you could be a member yeah, of the community. Everybody. That's everybody. I everybody. do that every day, so do you. That's yep. everybody and it's really important because we're trying to keep the virus out of the organization so that we keep it as safe as possible for, for all of you and all of us. In addition, um, we um, de decreased the visitors that could come into our organization, and that was a really hard one. I mean, it's just awful to think that you're, you're, the loved one can't come see somebody in the hospital. Mm -hmm. But we needed to keep what we would call the viral load as low as possible. We needed to decrease the number of people who potentially could be infecting other people. So we have bought iPads. We've done a number of other things to help the communication between a patient in the hospital and their family. Um, and then um, I think the other really important thing that we did is just to make sure that when you came to the or any of our medical centers and you were coming to be seen, you, if you had COVID-like symptoms, you went through one triage process. If you didn't, you went through another triage process. Mm -hmm. And the point of that is to avoid exposure. And we did give people masks as soon as they presented so that, you know, mine's coming down a bit. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> um, but... Um, we, um, we gave people masks and we said, okay, you've got symptoms consistent with COVID, you should be evaluated here as opposed to there. So all of these things, and those are just some of the examples, mm -hmm. both keep our patients safer and they keep our, our team members within Atlantic Health System safer. So let's pivot to a little bit more kind of as to where we are now. Um, we are, I mean, I, I cannot believe this, but it, it's the, it's what, six weeks sort of, I think really where I think a lot of attention started turning yep. to this really early March. Yep. And here we are now three quarters of the way through April. Um, and so it, it does seem that time is, and I'm sure for folks who are at home every day, time seems weird now compared to sure. how they used to perceive it. It does for me. I, I believe it. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, what we're doing now versus what we were doing mm -hmm. maybe several weeks ago. How are we learning from what's happening on the ground every day and evolving what we do to, right. to make sure we're changing as we need to? Right. Well, some of these things that we're doing are really therapeutic. They're about the care for patients. Some of those things are also about making sure that our communities understand what's safe and what's not safe. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about the therapeutic part, and as chief medical officer, that's obviously an important part of what, what I am involved in. You know, we, we have engaged in a number of clinical trials. Um, I've never seen so many clinical trials come so quickly. Um, and but through engaging or participating in clinical trials, we can offer therapeutics to our patients that we might otherwise not be able to. We've learned some basic things, and I know this sounds a little technical, but we have known in certain circumstances that having patients lie on their tummies instead of their backs mm. helps them oxygenate better. And this is something we've known for years, but we haven't known that it worked in, in particular ways in particular settings. So we have learned that this makes a difference for patients being able to oxygenate. So mm. through talking to colleagues, whether they're local or whether they're throughout the country, whether le reading literature, CDC, World Health Organization, we have made changes 
and taking opportunities, uh, advantage of the clinical trials to, um, to improve the care that we can offer patients who have this very, very difficult disease. The other thing we've learned, and it, suddenly all of our patients besides COVID, I mean, most of our patients disappear. We right. stop seeing the patients that we normally see, and some of that is understandable because some of that are surgeries that could be delayed without harming our patients. But some of it was people's fear about coming to our medical centers, and we're extraordinarily worried about that because we are finding, and you can see, I'm sure seen this in the press, where in this whole region, people are avoiding hospitals out of fear, and people are dying out of that fear. So people are staying home too long, and where our ambulances are being called, and people have died of heart attacks, people have died of strokes. Those were avoidable deaths often, and so we're incredibly concerned about that. All the things that we do each day and all the planning we've done are to make our, our medical centers, our medical practices, our offices as safe as possible. If a patient or you know, someone needs care and they can do it from a telehealth point of view, that's great. Mm -hmm. We're doing thousands of telehealth visits um, every day, and that's a great way to get care. But care sometimes needs to be provided face-to-face, -face, often needs to be provided face-to-face. -face. So we just want to remind everyone you know, not to avoid seeing your doctor. Call your doctor's office. Say what your symptoms are. They will help you understand how you should come, when you should come. Should you wait in your car before you come? Mm -hmm. you are, is there room in the waiting room? All of these things that, that, that it may be the new normal, but these, this new normal is incredibly important. For, um, for our communities. We're so worried about people who are avoiding care and as a re result getting sicker and we work and strive every day to make our medical centers and our practices safe for all of our communities and for all of our staff and team members. If you want more information about telehealth or, or some of the ways that we're taking those steps to make sure that everyone's safe, please go to our website, AtlanticHealth.org, um, and there you'll be able to find links to uh, telehealth and other resources there which you may find useful because to Dr. Jan's point, while we may be able to push pause on a number of things, um, illness uh, and chronic conditions will not. And so please, uh, please keep that in mind when you think about your well-being and the well-being of those you care about. Luke, would you mind, I of have, a, I have a, a little testimonial from a woman who recently had her, her baby at one of our hospitals and uh, I thought it might be, be uplifting and reassuring if I just sure. read a little of what she said. So. She and her husband waited at home the appropriate amount of time between contractions. I think this was her, her, at least her second child. And she says, we reached the hospital around 6 a.m. at the main entrance. Got fever screening, I told you. We're doing these, the, the tests at the door, done, and then went straight to, to the sixth floor. We were immediately taken in after a few, few paperwork, and the room was kept ready for us. 6.15 to 7.30, all basic vitals were checked by the nurse, doctor came, checked dilation. Then at 7.45, epidural was given. 9.15, the doctor broke my water. And at 9.52, I delivered. The doctors, nurses, and overall care was just fantastic. Smiling faces in the midst of this crazy time was such a blessing. I would request soon to be moms to not be scared. There are some phenomenal people working hard to keep you safe. All the best to, to the soon-to-be moms and dads. Everything's going to be great. Um, wear your mask and keep washing your hands. That's so amazing. I think that's just an extraordinary testimonial to what the experience is for our new moms. And I think we've had 800 deliveries in the last wow. month um, throughout the system safely done and uh, with, with great outcomes. Well, congratulations to them. Yeah. And, and certainly really important for folks to keep stories just like that in mind. Um, and, and while some folks may find some of that information surprising, that um, I'm wondering what's been surprising for you throughout this process. I mean, you and and I want to touch base on something that you said in one of your previous answers in talking about the work you've been doing, communicating with other experts across the country. I'm sure you've been talking to people across the world. Yeah. Um, has that what, what's been surprising about this process and how we've adjusted the way we deliver care uh, okay. to you? So I think the first thing isn't really about the process, it's about this particular virus, which has been in incredibly surprising to me. And it's, it's because of the myriad of ways that this virus um, presents itself. So we think, and we don't have the exact numbers, it depends on the study, that up to 25% and perhaps more of people who have this virus never have any symptoms. Um, and that's, that is not typical for something that we're used to seeing. And influenza, you may have you may be contagious as we think as we think you are with coronavirus for up to two days before you have any symptoms. But having no symptoms at all is really unusual. So that that's been a surprise. And then on the other end of the spectrum, how incredibly serious this is. 
Um, this is not a disease just of the lungs. It's a multi-system disease. We, when we were hearing things coming out of China, it was a pneumonia. It was a disease of the lungs. But now we see the kidneys are affected, the heart's affected, the nervous system's affected. It's a very complicated illness. So it's, it's I think, surprising to all, uh, all clinicians that you have this incredible spectrum of no symptoms to extraordinarily awful um, and difficult to treat um, problems. The other thing is just how rapidly the clinical trials started. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, I've been involved with research for years and it's usually a painstaking, long, at times onerous process and everybody out there, so many drug companies and scientists, et cetera, are really trying to think, okay, what medications do we have right now who may, that may work in this particular um, disease because of the pathophysiology of that medication and that disease. So a lot of, lot of research is going on internationally in this. And then the other thing I, I think that um, has been a, a challenge for all of us and nothing new is just the difficulty of introducing widespread testing has continued to surprise me. So I think those are the three main elements of surprise for me. And I'm, and I'm sure for some folks who are, look, this information, and not just what we're sharing, but the media coverage on this obviously right. has been 24-7 going on now more than two months. And so yeah. I'm sure that people are getting exposed to a lot of information, whether it be um, the research that's being done, the uh, yeah. situation around testing, that perhaps they're not coming into these conversations with the background of knowledge that, that other folks might have. Mm -hmm. So a lot of, for a lot of folks, it was a lot of running to catch up on their understanding of what some of these things even are, antibody testing and, right. how, and, and how vaccines are developed. and all. These are complicated policy Very. and issues. So, um, so I think folks, if to stay on top of this stuff, obviously, like I said, go to our website, but that's part of the reason why we're doing conversations like this, to give people a sense of, of what really is happening here. Yeah. So, um, As I said, we did uh, request a number of, as we always do, a number mm -hmm. of, of questions from our community, folks who enjoy um, and have questions, uh, these types of forums, and, and, and want to participate. So we appreciate everybody uh, taking the time to do that. We can't get to all of them, because there's a lot, but I tried to group them into large groups, and one of the ones that were the most of the questions that we got surrounded what we're wearing now, mm. masks, right? How to, which ones are appropriate for which settings? Yeah. Can you wash them? Can you reuse them? Um, and you and I are wearing different masks, right? There's the homemade, but then mm -hmm. there's the paper ones as well. Can you um, share some general guidance around sure. what you recommend for mask usage? Yeah. And then, um, and, and ones like what you have, how useful they can be as well. Yeah. So, you know, you've probably seen the um, term in the press of universal masking, and you've heard what the governors of our state and the adjacent states are recommending, as well as the CDC. So, um, the, the benefit of masks is they decrease the risk that you, if you have the virus, particularly, you know, people who have no idea, or that you're around people who have the virus would spread it. So um, it's not going to work unless you social distance as well. It's not going to work unless you wash your hands as well. But it is a really, really um, excellent way to um, protect um, society by wearing masks. So Atlantic Health System, we have everybody masking um, at this time. Now, in the medical centers, they're wearing different masks than I'm wearing. I'm not in a hospital right now. I'm at the corporate headquarters. So I can wear a homemade mask and therefore save the masks that we need in the medical centers. Like the N95 for, Exactly. Like so the respirators that, that we use and um, some of our impermeable masks that are important when you're around patients. Um, I know it's frustrating because where are you going to get them? Um, and there certainly has been, a, you know, a, there, the supply will catch up with the need. Mm -hmm. But for now, the supply has been um, a little bit slow in doing that. So if you go onto the CDC website, um, there are a number of very um, interesting and useful tools that are meant for community members. And one of them is use of cloth face coverings to help slow the spread of COVID-19. And it goes through when you should wear it, how you should wear it. And it even has instructions on how you can make it. Make your own mask with a t-shirt. So there's lots of really great um, pieces of information that we'll link to this Facebook. Um, okay. We'll put those um, available to our audience. But so it's, so it's important. Now, that, now in terms of the face masks um, and the ones like the one I'm using, the homemade ones, basically they should be washed frequently. That, that's the, what the CDC says. So what I'm doing, because I'm wearing one every day and I have two, um, is I can take this home and I can wash this at night. 
and then um, in the washing machine, in, in the washing or, machine, yeah. and then a dryer, hot, hot dryer, and then I can wear it again the next day. Um, I'm careful about how I take it off. Okay, I don't want to touch the front of it. That's an area, or even inside of it, I want to take it off if, when I do mm -hmm. by these ear loops, or if I had ties in the back, and then carefully set it down someplace um, when I'm home where I'm not worried about anybody else having an exposure to it. Sure. Um, so this is a really important thing um, when I go out and take. You know, and I, I see people without them, I get a little unhappy, right? That this is really just one more avenue to, um, to provide safety in our communities. So don't, don't disappoint, Dr. Chan, yeah, don't folks. Disappoint. Don't, Thank geez, you. Yeah, don't do that. Thank now, you. I would, it, usually folks are not uh, speaking for long periods of time like we are, and so you may notice that we're kind of tugging them up along right. the sides. It's, uh, it's obviously hand washing is always a, an important part of this. Those mm -hmm. standard um, rules and things that we... Uh, have applied even before we were wearing masks pretty consistently, Absolutely. still apply. So don't think that just because you're wearing your mask, you don't have to wash your hands. You definitely still have, have to do that too. Um, we touched on this um, a little earlier, and I'm curious, and I'm wondering if you would um, maybe willing to address it as well. Um, folks who are curious about receiving care, uh, they maybe they perhaps had certain treatments and things that they would be, uh, that they were putting off. Let's reinforce that point again, if you can, because we took a couple yeah. of questions on that. People wondering, look, you know, could I go to an, an urgent care clinic? You know, I, I, right. I'm just, there's things where I know I need to see somebody about it, but I'm concerned about coming to the hospital. Yeah. Um, that really can be a huge risk for folks if they push huge, that off. Huge risk. And I would organize this in my own mind, um, and it would for my family members, um, in the following ways. If, if I've got, you know, something that seems like mild illness, but something that I really do want to address with a, a doctor or another provider, I would go the telehealth route. I would, you know, there's no reason. It, I would have gone the telehealth route, you know, before this. It's a convenient, easy way to, to get care. Um, before that, if you have a doctor, I think it makes sense to call the, your doctor's office and say, these are my symptoms, what do you advise? And he or she may be able to help you over the phone. They may say, please come in and set up an appointment, and this is how we're going to do this. And for emergencies um, and urgent issues you, 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 that need emergency department care, please don't wait. Our emergency departments are functioning fantastically. They've done a remarkable job. We've created different sections of the emergency department based on you know, what people are coming for. Um, and we are there to provide the care that everyone in our community needs. And I, I would be, um, I am worried. I'm worried about what we're seeing, what um, all of New Jersey and New York City are seeing in terms of people avoiding care and then ending up in deaths. It's, you know, just a tragic, tragic outcome. So please, um, we, we, are, we are providing safe care. Um, we're providing the high quality care that we've always provided. So please don't delay getting care. Um, so again, um, Dr. Jan, I appreciate you doing this. This is it's a great resource for folks. And so uh, please, um, we're gonna as we continue to do these, please don't forget to send in questions, and we will try to get to as many of them as we can throughout this process. We're gonna have um, our president and CEO Brian Granielotti is gonna do uh, one of these as well. I think we're gonna try to get him scheduled for next week, so great. folks can can Good. hear more about what we're doing as a full system. Um, so I guess we have just time, another minute or two left before we wrap, and I'm I'm wondering. Um, just in terms of where we go from here, right? Um, folks need to kind of understand that this is, we're in this for the long haul, right? right. And so um, as we do, um, I just, any lasting thoughts about sure. social distancing, the value of, 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 of those hygiene tips that we keep giving to folks, any yeah. final messages you want to yeah, share? Yeah, I mean, first of all, let's celebrate the successes. Um, it's so important. We, we discharge many, many patients from our system every day. New Jersey, um, we see the statistic, statistic every day of the numbers of patients, you know, the hundreds of patients who are discharged to home, to their families. Mm -hmm. So we need to celebrate um, in what seems like pretty dire times those things that are going right, those things that, you know, we should all be very happy and grateful about. So that's number one. Number two, it's very hard to adjust to the fact that this is a new normal. And until we have a vaccine, and we don't know whether that at this point is going to be 12 months from now, 18 months from now, it's mm -hmm. unclear. Um, but until we have a vaccine that's effective, um, we, we really are going to have to live different lives. And those lives have to do with thinking very seriously about where you're going, who you're going with, when you're wearing your mask, washing hands, keeping that distance of at least six feet between you. 
and other people. And I, you know, I know in my personal life, I'm experiencing, you know, when when I'm seeing my family, um, you know, when I'm seeing friends, I'm doing a lot more uh, FaceTime than I've ever done yeah. before. Zoom and FaceTime and, and, FaceTime and all those and, things. We're all learning and, how to use them. And this adjustment, it's it's very hard for us to acknowledge that this is going to be a a long term problem. But mm -hmm. when we get through this first wave, um, there will be episodes of recurrence and how serious they are have a lot to do with how everybody in our community behaves um, or regarding those things that we can do to um, make our communities safer. You must get tons of questions, as I'm sure everybody does. We go, when will there be a vaccine? Vaccine development and creation is, is complicated, right? Yeah, I mean, there, yeah. there, are, there can be side effects to vaccines yeah. too, right? Yeah. So, so, you know, you have to make sure, first of all, that it works. So even the influenza vaccine mm -hmm. that, you know, is a vaccine we've made for years, how effective it is each year, and we have to have a new one each year because there are new strains each year, right. um, how effective that is, um, is first of all key. And there's no point in vaccinating a large amount of people if it's not going to work. Right. The second thing is it's got to be safe. You don't want people to be worse off as a result of a vaccine. So these are all things that unfortunately take time. The development of a vaccine is faster than it used to be because we have technical, technological um, ability that we didn't have 20 or 30 years ago or even 10 years ago. But it still needs to be tested in people. We still need to make sure that it gives the immunity that we need. And we still have to make sure that it can be given safely. Dr. Jan, I appreciate you taking some Thank time. Thank you. Thank we you really, so much. really, really do appreciate it. All right, folks. So um, as, as we wind down here, um, again, we're going to try to do these. And I apologize. It keeps sort of I'm not used to doing this with a mask on, as I'm sure we're all learning new ways to do things with masks on. Um, we are going to try to get to one of these uh, at least every week. We may be doing multiple ones within a week, depending upon our, um, our ability to get folks to come in to do them. Um, but be sure to stay tuned um, and follow up on both our Facebook page and on our website because a lot of the information we're sharing about scheduling these things and, and in case you miss it, a lot of those uh, links to previous um, episodes of our community conversations will be there too. Or our YouTube channel is another way to do it as well. Uh, we are really trying to provide as much information as we can to all of you um, so that you know the steps you need to take to stay safe. So again, I appreciate everybody joining us uh, today on this community conversation. Much more to come in the weeks ahead. Uh, please stay safe out there, uh, listen to the guidance, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much.